Uh, welcome to uh, today's class on supervision. Um, uh, today's guest speaker um, has a wealth of information, and I was going over her bio, and you know, it's funny, I was telling uh, Julie before, um, when I arrived rather, that I was worried that she wasn't going to be able to find Wheeler Hall. Then I kind of went through the bio and realized that she did her undergraduate work here. She did her, she has two masters from Berkeley, so she's an old blue uh, in every sense. Um, uh, when I asked Julie about videotaping this session, she um, she she agreed, and then she wants to know if she got a dressing room. Uh, she wanted special water. She wanted no. I'm kidding. She didn't want to. She's very. Uh, agreeable to this and so thank you for for, for being here. Uh, Julie uh, Brown is just a couple things about Julie. She, she is a consultant uh, with uh, Julie Brown uh, and Associates. Uh, she has done a, a number of things um, uh, for the last few years um, including uh, some of her clients have been the Permanente uh, Medical Group, Kaiser Foundation, Hospitals, Mayo Clinic, UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Uh, she has spoken internationally and nationally on her research regarding uh, successful leadership, healthcare, women's issues, emotional intelligence, and personality types. Um, like I said, she holds a master's degree from uh, Berkeley uh, School of Business and the School of Public Health and did her undergraduate work in psychology and social welfare from UC Berkeley. So um, I think today's session is going to be Terrific. Uh, she's got a wealth of uh, uh, knowledge and information to share with us, and I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Julie. Great. Thanks, Bernard, and thank you for having me here. Welcome, everybody. I am glad to see some very familiar faces and some new ones as well. So how many of you are students in the School of Public Health right now? Okay, and how many of you are professionals out in the community? Pretty much everybody else. Is anybody else anything else? <laughs> Okay, great. And how many of you have managed people before? Okay, great. So I'm going to ask a few things before we get started, but let me tell you a little bit more about what my perspective is and what I'm hoping to share with you. I have been doing my own management consulting work for the past 14 years, but before that I actually worked in the healthcare industry, primarily in hospitals and multi-hospital systems. So I am a former hospital CEO for Kaiser, worked in South San Francisco for a number of years, also worked at Alta Bates and Herrick, oops, also worked at uh, Blue Cross, I'm trying to think of some of the local things. So my supervisory or leadership perspective comes from those viewpoints. And for those of you that have supervised before, I hope you'll be able to add in your own perspectives because I think there's no right answers when it comes to how you can be an effective supervisor. It not only has to do with the tool set that people want you to see, but they also have to be incorporated with who you are as a leader. And there are a whole lot of different kinds of leaders here today. So I want to make sure that people are engaged in a way that they feel comfortable sharing differences of opinion from what I'm offering up. And hopefully this will be an interactive session, OK? Any questions before we start? OK, now let me see if this works. Of course not. That would be too easy. So I'm just going to use um, the routine thing. So here's what I'm hoping we're going to do today. One is identify the key characteristics of highly effective supervisors. And you all are going to develop that list for me. I'll talk about that in a moment. Talk in, interspersed throughout the conversation about key accountabilities and challenges common to supervision. And then I'm going to talk about some of the more common elements of supervision and see if we can't go through some in-servicing based on your interest levels. So first and foremost, I want to find out from all of you, because we could probably talk for the next three days. OK, well, I could talk for the next three days. You all might not be here listening to that. But what do you most want to hear about as we talk about supervision? Because I want to narrow the list down. Thank you. That would be very helpful. Thanks, Bernard. What do you most want to hear about? Please. Conflict, OK, we'll talk a little bit about that. It's probably its own session. I can give you uh, some resources. Please. Performance, Performance management, OK. Uh, team. OK, team. I know that you all had a, a session a few weeks ago about team, right? So I'll touch a little bit on that. And then maybe you can tell me some about what you learned. Mm -hmm. Managing up. Managing up. Uh, motivating people. Motivating people. Oh, this is a great short list. Performance appraisal. Performance appraisal. Okay. Oh, please. <laughs> Balance? Does that ever happen? 
that's probably a whole course in and of itself. But yeah, that's a big challenge. If you're going to be effective, you have to make sure that you're doing for yourself to be effective as a leader. Okay. Other thoughts? Okay, I can work with that. And if anything comes up as we talk, um, I will focus on these. Is this okay for most people? And again, for those of you who have been with me, this means yes, it's very affirming. This means no. You don't have to have a lot of energy. I just want to make sure that there's nothing out there that folks really want to see. Okay, great. So this is what we're going to do. We have a very large group here today. But what I want to do is to break you up into about four groups. And I want you to discuss these two things. Sorry, each of you is going to discuss one of these two things. I'm going to draw an arbitrary line in the back. You figure out where that is, maybe the back two rows, and divide it maybe where the camera is, somewhere around here. You two groups, I want you to talk about the characteristics of the best supervisor you've ever worked with. These two groups, I want you to talk about the worst characteristics uh, of a supervisor that you've worked with. So I want you to think of a great either team situation, reporting situation that you've worked with, you two groups back there, get together. This is, this is group interaction time. So I see people looking around going, oh, man. No, nope, this is group interaction time. Share those experiences. These two groups, the same thing. Think of something where you couldn't get up in the morning because it was so awful. What was awful about it? What was going on? What were the dynamics of this individual? And jot those down so we can share them, OK? Let me take a few minutes with that. So maybe just take about seven minutes to talk about that. So why don't you wrap up, but stay where you are. Finish that last thought. You're so attentive, you got quiet really fast. So we're good to go again. So, sounded like you had some good conversations. Before you move completely back, just turn your chairs around so you can see. I want to start with the, uh, these two groups, the dark side. And we'll call it poor supervision. But I just want to say one thing before I uh, go ahead. I think I forgot to mention that any role that manages people is about supervision. So supervision is a concept, not a job title. So when I was a hospital CEO, for example, I had a team of anywhere from five to 10 people reporting to me. And I considered the bulk of my role to be supervision, not only of them, but of the functions in the organization. So as you think about it, I just want you to open up your minds and think of yourself in a leadership role and realize that even if you're managing a team that's not reporting to you, that's supervision. If you have direct reports, that's supervision. If you're an individual contributor, but you're overseeing a function that involves other people, you are supervising, OK? So keep that mindset that it's managing people, but can also be functions or activities. So let's talk about the dark side and kind of go back and forth here and see what kind of a list we get. So throw a characteristic out. And we needed to bring you back into the light. So micromanager, OK? How about the other group? Disorganized. Keep going. Poor communication skills. Poor communication. What did that look like? Or like lack of communication skills. Okay, so what did that look like? Um, you know, today, especially with the phone. And what's the problem with that? Passive aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, passive aggressive mind readers. Ooh. There's chocolate over here if you need to go to someplace safe and comfortable. <laughs> How about this group? Another one from here. Unprofessional, Unprofessional in what way? OK. Unprofessional behavior. OK, go ahead. Insincere. Some, insincere in what way? So um, like giving praise when the sound is kind of fake. And my example, I was a supervisor, they would always just say, like, oh, you're such a rock star. OK. So insincere praise. You're such a rock star. And the next day, you're such a rock star. You are such a rock star. I've got it. How about over here? Withholding information. Ooh, withholding information. What do you think that was about? 
control, okay? How about this group, another one? Go ahead. Okay, so overwhelmed with own workload, okay? How about this other group? No feedback, why is that a problem? Then you only have your own opinion to go by. That's not bad on my world. <laughs> no feedback. What kind of problems did that cause for you? Big, <laughs> Big problems. Okay. Did expectations somehow differ when you got to the end point? I don't know who said that. So no performance evals, no feedback, didn't know where you were going, et cetera. Okay. Oh, that's a problem too. Didn't care. Okay. I'm sorry? Apathy. Okay. Ouch. More from this group? Yelling. Yelling. Ouch. Can't make decisions. Ooh. Oh, I can see why you all came back to school. <laughs> run away, run away. Another one from this group? So interesting. So where do we have micromanage or too offhand? So too distant, too close. Kind of different sides of the same coin, right? Anything else from either group? Oh, another good one. Inability to delegate. Others? Lack of respect. Lack of respect. I'm sorry? Distrust. Distrust. That's always a big one, isn't it? Anything else? Okay. I'll say don't advocate. Is that okay? All right. And tell me more about that. Just, you know, treating people differently. Ah, favorites. okay. Inconsistency, favoritism. Yeah. Okay. You all have been through some really trying times. I'm so sorry. Anything else you'd like to see in our short list? Lack of transparency. Ah, lack of transparency. Okay. Yes. Okay. I would say prejudicial values. And there's lots of ways you can slice out when that would be problematic. We all carry our own baggage into the room, but when you're not cognizant of that or aware of how it's going in and not effectively working with people, big problem. Okay. Anything else? All right, we're going to bring you back from the edge because we're going to go back to the good supervisory experience. Thank you for that. So let's just talk about um, effective supervision. So let's hear about those two, two lists. And let's just go back and forth with whoever was the keeper. Go ahead. Praise. Lots of praise. Lots of praise. So not the rock star comment over here, but... Sincere praise, okay. What else? Consistency. Consistency. Consistency? Keep going. I'm rotating, but if you can, there's a void, jump in. Trust. Trust. Grants autonomy. Autonomy. Grants autonomy. Big one for most professionals. Okay, so fostering development, does that work? Okay. Fostering development and growth, okay. From the other group? Challenges you and ask questions and then answer. Oh, I love it. 
challenges you and asks questions you haven't considered. What else? Easy going? Uh huh. Responsive. Always very nice, isn't it? You ask a question, ask for follow up, and they actually do. Uh huh. Okay. Reliable, follows through. What else? Supportive. Mm hmm. So open to your perspective. Does that work? Okay. Offers offers objective feedback. Mm hmm. Anything else you want to make this hot list? Organized. Organized. I'm sorry, something else? Truthful. Organized and truthful. Mm -hmm. Someone who fights their own battles. Ah. Fights own battles. Okay. Yes. What was that? A Berkeley grad. <laughs> well, doesn't that encompass this entire list? You had your hand up. Uh huh. Willing to let you go. I always used to say that one of the most flattering things that could happen to me as a supervisor would be to have people promoted away from me. Because it said something right about what I was doing, as opposed to they were fleeing my uh, supervision. <laughs> At least that's how I framed it, so it worked for me. Anything else you want on this short list? Ah, gets to know you as a person. Recognize your strengths. Great. Recognizes your strengths and ability. Anything else? Any final couple comments? What do you notice about these two lists? Kind of opposites, aren't they? Two sides of the same coin. The dark and the light. The chocolate and the vanilla. The A and the B, however you want to put it. For those of you who have supervised, do you always live on this list? <laughs> Everybody's going, no, no. This is true. We know a few supervisors who always are on this list. We all have these moments. So our objective personally is to figure out how we can spend more time on this list. And when we're not on this list, how we can move back or what we use as a guide to know that we're in trouble or something's not effective. So you've just created two lists. One is a place that you don't want to go consistently. The other are things that you should aspire to. So let's talk a little bit about how we can stay on that page a little bit longer. OK, it's working, but now I have to work with it. Forward, forward. OK, so one of the things those of you who heard me talk about uh, leadership before will come to realize is that it's incredibly important to be effective as a leader or a supervisor that you have to know yourself. If you don't know your own strengths, your own abilities, your style, your preference, it's going to be very difficult for you to move and manage other people. Okay? So understanding those is very important. You also need to display authentic leadership and transparency. What do you think I mean by those two words? Let's get bantered about a lot. Authentic leadership and transparency. This is the audience participation time, so just jump right in. Okay, so some sense of honesty there and self-awareness and putting that out there. Great, what else? Yes? Be willing to acknowledge my ability to be a poor leader. Have clients not glossing over 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging tough times, acknowledging what's real and there in the environment that's palpable that everybody else is seeing rather than ignoring it. Any other comments? Setting example, modeling what you're asking other people to do. There's another component in authentic leadership, and this is about being who you are. So while there's certainly behaviors and skills that I think you as leaders need to evoke within yourselves as supervisors, you have to do it in a way that fits your personality and your style. And the way I like to describe that is that you're wearing an outfit that rocks your supervisory style. You're not wearing someone else's outfit, someone else's hat. You're not emulating someone who doesn't fit for you. So knowing yourself and also incorporating what you'd like to have done in a way that reflects your personality and your preferences is important. And here are some things that you've talked about. And these are some of the global things. I'm going to global now because I want to talk about some things. Supervisor set unit performance direction. So it's incredibly important for people to know where they're going. And as smart as Berkeley graduates are, and as intelligent as non-Berkeley grads can be, don't presume that folks walking into your unit or when you take something over will automatically assume where it is you want to go. If it's obvious, state the obvious. You need to manage employee performance for your desired results. Also, you said, very well put, maximizing the talents and abilities of your team, whatever they might be. Balancing your time between supervision and management, multitasking. If someone asks about how you do that, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but essentially I'm going to say by knowing yourself and how to use your time, maximizing it so your folks are doing things and you have time to be able to take care of other responsibilities you, are, you have, that's really effective. Seeking feedback and assessing outcomes, so measuring your results, measuring your performance, very important. Ah. <laughs> this isn't meant to be the humorous part of the session. All right, so I think I've got a low battery and it's just acting out, so I'm just going to flip it. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is creating a vision. This is an important thing. So again, a roadmap. If your work unit, your team doesn't have a shared vision, they are not going to be working in concert with each other. They're not going to be moving in the same direction. You're going to be utilizing resources in a way that's not effective. And there are a lot of different ways that you can sit down and do that. So some of us walk into units where you have a business plan or you are asked to write a business plan. That's part of a roadmap. Unit-specific goals and objectives. Sometimes they cascade down from the overall organization. Sometimes you have the freedom to develop your own. Sometimes you're responding to a grant award you've gotten. It's very specific. Thou shalt do these things within the next five minutes, right? And then you have metrics. So realigning your activities constantly, identifying ways to redistribute your resources, and celebrating your accomplishments. So I notice nobody really said that there. That's a really important way of acknowledging things. And that, I guess it kind of goes with the praise. Someone back here talked about praise. Being able to celebrate those milestones is really important, no matter how small. Now, you may have some people on your team who are doing the work in and of itself is what they're there for. And you know, celebration isn't a big deal. And that's fine. However, if you don't acknowledge where you've been and what you've done, you don't have that motivation to go on. So it's really important to celebrate those things. And we'll talk about that. OK, let's talk. Any questions on just, I didn't want to spend a lot of time there, especially since you all didn't really have a lot of interest in that. Any questions on that? And please stop me with any questions you have or push back on anything you'd like to uh, uh, say differently. Meaning, thanks for sharing, Julie, but I've got another viewpoint. That's fine by me. So let's talk real quickly about hiring. What are some of the benefits of hiring the right person of the, for the job? And what are the costs when you hire the wrong person? What happens when you've got the right person in the job? What do you see? What occurs? Please. Tell me more about that. OK.
Okay. And that clip happened there. Okay. Um, so now, you know, as you find people, trying to hire people that are more fit to work with a whole group of sales. Okay. As opposed to just, you know, uh, filling in for a bunch of them. Great. Great. So the team works better, complements other individuals, I heard. There's a rhythm there, offers strengths that may be on the group, may not be on the group. So once that person comes up to speed, people are going, there's traction. To paraphrase something that you said much better. What other things? Yes? So if someone's got the skill base, even though everybody usually goes through an orientation, so they're developing, they get up to speed, once they do, you are not micromanaging their work. You're not double checking for mistakes. You're not trying to head them off from disaster constantly. And they're getting the job done. So you can focus on the larger picture or making the other pieces work together or providing support where it's needed. So again, even great workers sometimes go to the dark side of the planet, right? Fall off. Sometimes you need to do a little bit of coaching there. But when things are really working well, you've got the right people on your team, it's just like a well put together quilt. All the pieces work, even though the patterns may be different, even though the color themes may be different, the quilt works. Please, Bernard. I was going to say that when you hire the wrong person, it affects the whole team. It just disrupts the office or wherever you're at, and it just, you know, it, 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 it breaks things down. Mm -hmm. and the whole team is less effective, not just that person, but everybody. Right. Everything goes wrong when you've got someone who really is not a fit. Who do you think is to blame when you're some, you've got someone on your team who is not a fit? And you've hired that person. <laughs> exactly. Something's amiss with what you did in the hiring process. All right. So if you had the hiring authority and you bring someone on board and they're not salvageable or there's all this disruption, there was something wrong with what you did in the hiring process. So let's talk a little bit about that. But don't, don't you oh. think people, I mean, people sometimes interview really, really well. Mm -hmm. They're great. Mm -hmm. You love them. Absolutely. Then you, they start working, and they're great for <laughs> <laughs> Then they start working, and that other personality comes out. They started out being Charlotte. They turn into Sybil. What happened? The reality is that they're tools to help you ferret that out. So they're going to be people who are better fits than not. Sometimes you won't be able to ferret that out unless you have massive amounts of psychological inventories, a private psychologist coming in, 58 <laughs> interviews. But I'm going to show you ways in which you can try to get some of that information on the table. And for those of you who are in the job market now, you have the benefit of having a lot of really good people looking for work. That's how I look at that. So, Inevitably, it's really nice right now, not for the people looking for work, don't hear me say that, but it's really nice because usually when you have an applicant pool, you can very easily see those great candidates bubble to the top. And then you're working with the best of the best in your hiring decision. You have some flexibility. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about that. So here's some elements of the hiring process. And they sound very straightforward, but again, to get the right people, you want to make sure you're doing well. Create or update your job description. And you'd be surprised how many organizations, you know, you pull something out, it's moth-eaten, or you should just know, everybody does this, you put together a paragraph. If you're not being explicit about what the requirements are, again, you're not sharing with folks what you expect them to do or the skill sets. So advertise for the position. I won't go into too much into that. Screen for candidates. Develop your interview process and conduct those interviews. Check references. This is always very interesting. How many people give you bad references? Very few. So I'm going to ask some of you who've gone through this process, how do you really get information from people to make sure that this person is who you want? We'll talk about that. You make an offer, you contact unsuccessful people. Onboarding. This is oftentimes where people make mistakes. Don't assume because you've got a fabulous person who's done this job in another organization before that they can walk in the door and start out at 90%. They are not familiar with your organization in all likelihood. They may be familiar with the tenets of the job, but not your culture, not you as a leader, not your team. Develop that onboarding plan. 
Make sure they have exposure to other team members and monitor that with them. And then you um, announce your candidate selection. Okay. So screening. Again, a lot of luxury nowadays in terms of having a lot of people interested. So resume versus application, lots of times, especially now, you do both and then some. So in your application process, if you have the latitude, ask them for information that you're interested in that goes above and beyond just the where's your degree, where did you work before, da 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 da. Do it. Use that as a screening tool. Take the time. And that way you don't have to sit down and ask that in an interview with perhaps people that you shouldn't be talking to. Yes? So the question is about the length of the application. I'm cracking up because if you really want this job, you're going to be baking me cookies and coming over and cleaning my house, right? So yes, yeah, that can be off-putting to some people, but it gives you more information up front. And if I'm trying to sell myself to you and show you I want this job, I'm going to do whatever you ask. So there is a little bit of a generational thing. So I'll say that being a gen, I don't know whatever it is, a gen deer. So with gen Ys and gen Xers, wait, do I have that right? Gen Xers in particular? A lot of them will exclude themselves for reasons like that. This is way too long. This is way inconvenient. I don't have time for this. That may be a barrier because that might be the right person, so you have to balance that out. But at the same time, if you're looking for some specific info that you may not be able to cover in an interview process, I would encourage you to try to highlight the most important things on an application form. Question? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It depends on what the questions are. But, I mean, if you're Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. If there's cookies on there, if I'm sitting out and saying, how much cleaning experience do you have? It's not appropriate to the job. I would say that's a red flag. Absolutely. But if, for example, I'm asking about specific experiences you've had, particular papers that you've written, more so than giving me a CV, asking you for example of your writing work or a project work, things that are fairly typical when folks are looking for a fairly involved um, application process, that's helpful to the screener. And you want to rule yourself in. So here you are hiring supervisor. Let me flip that around and say, one of the things I tell younger people about resumes, folks have a tendency to have 15-page resumes. Mm -hmm. And my resume is two pages. And I'm a lot older than most people in this room. And that's not to say, wow, aren't I fabulous. It's two pages long, because if I ever apply for a job, how much time do you think people spend screening people in based on a resume? Any guesses on time spent on a resume screen? 30 seconds? Minute, eight seconds? Last time it was checked, 12 seconds. Think about how much time you put together your resume. Isn't that just wrong? So screening in on a resume when you have a ton, very quick. So it's got to be there. So if you happen to have a whole lot of applicants, you may want to spend the time putting that application together to help with that screen. Get info that might not be on that resume and rule them in. So it's your call. It's a style thing. But I think in particular, especially for jobs that are not entry level jobs, where you may have a whole field of candidates with lots of differences, you might want to have a little bit more of an application process. Yes? Hmm, that's a good question. For very skills-based organization where there are things that are um, quantitative abilities that are very clearly outlined, uh, writing, programming, uh, quantitative skills, things that can be objectively measured, if they're in existence, usually an organization will have them. You know, for admin assistance, typing, proficiencies with particular software, those are there. If it's not that kind of job, I don't know how much value it adds. Because for the most part, those are learned skills. But if they're absolutely basic, then I'd say yeah, especially in the HR department, they've got something set up with that. Yes? Um, I worked in civil service, mm -hmm. so you know we had a lot of limitations yeah. around what the application process yep. actually looked like. Um, but as a way of kind of screening, it's going to say you can use your job description to screen out. Absolutely. As well as screening in, because we did get the right the job description, so in terms of updating it, beyond like the minimum requirements and the skills, we would say stuff specifically about the population we work with um, to kind of make sure that you didn't get people who were interested in the pay scale for the skill level, 
but say didn't weren't comfortable in an environment that served homeless people. So we would say things like um, preferred, you know, or <laughs> would build into the job description. We'll be interacting, Models. even if it was a front desk or Models. an admin job. We'll be interacting with homeless people off the streets. We'll be sharing responsibilities, so that you kind of got a sense of what an individual's comfort level was going to be with within the environment. Really like that. Yeah, and what she is saying is essentially listing things as part of the job description to rule out people who might not ultimately be interested in that role. And it may not be obvious in the job description or in the position. So don't bother me if you're not interested in this because it's going to waste both of our times. And you're speaking what might happen as opposed to, hmm, instead of saying, I will, I'm going to put down, you may have to work with a psychopathic boss because my boss really is. And describe, you're putting real things down. right? You don't want to put the psychopathic boss thing down. But talking about populations you might work with, Talking about possibility of having to work extended hours on a regular basis, travel that's extensive, uh, you know, scheduling with different kinds of groups of people in the community, anything that is real that will be helpful to people screening themselves in or out. Other comments on that? Yes, thank you. Um, um, some health department applications work off of something called an eligibility list. Mm -hmm. They have a standard application. Mm -hmm. Job description, but when they add questions, so you can write essay form. What is your um, opinion about how to answer it on, on the applicant's point of view, and then how to read it from the, I don't know, the, the hiring? Mm -hmm. I think it depends. That's my answer. How about that? So, as a supervisor, I think you have to do the work in advance to decide what you're looking for in those applications. <laughs> So I wouldn't take a big stack of apps and start looking through them and saying, sounds good, doesn't sound good. Decide what your minimum criteria or the elements are up in advance. Very, very important. Then as an applicant, try to take a look at what are the job requirements, what are the jobs, specifically what do you have that's sexy that may appeal to that role or that might be unique and different. So just in generalities, do the work of defining up front and then if you're an applicant, sitting down and trying to differentiate yourself in a real way. Does that help? Without skirting the issue too much? It really does with the role. It really does. So again, got to do the work up front to define that for yourself. Yes? I think, I mean, we will get to cover letters, but uh, like in terms of like figuring out what makes someone sexy, like you can talk all you want about your qualifications, but if you don't mention what the job is, right. how that fits, like people just, I work in research, if people don't mention the word research, I'm not going to there you go. Because it's like, you don't want this job, you want that job. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't going to cover cover letters at all because, again, I'm trying to do this from the supervisory perspective. But if I'm a supervisor, what I want to see, a hiring supervisor, I want to say, how'd you find out about the job? That's the first paragraph. In the second paragraph, show me some understanding that you know what the job is, that you're talking about your resume or <coughs> highlighting sexy experiences, again, that apply to what I'm looking for. Differentiate yourself and tell me why I should hire you as opposed to the woman next to you. And in the close, telling me that you're going to be following up with me in some fashion. So I do a workshop specifically on cover letters and hiring and resume and everything else. We literally spend about an hour talking about that. One of the things that I like about um, that class is the thing that I always tell people is that as a hiring supervisor, if I'm spending 12 seconds on your resume, guess how much time I'm spending on your cover letter? Just a little bit less than that. You got to grab my attention. So the excuse is always, geez, if I had more time, I would have shortened my resume. If I had more time, I would have written a shorter cover letter. Spend the time to get it concise. Spend the time to really make every word matter for that reason. OK, now flipping it back. Because you supervisors are so busy, you don't have time for all that verbiage. Don't make me look for this stuff on five pages. OK. Um, OK, so this is very interesting. I have still found this in looking at resumes. Sometimes dates don't match. Sometimes experiences are a little bit different. I found people talking about jobs in organizations where I was there during that time frame, and I knew those jobs didn't exist. Yeah, I know. You think this day and age? So check for regularities on a scan, and then contact your viable candidates. You see a lot yeah. of typos. I mean, things oh, like it makes me crazy. Yeah. So we, at my previous job, 
we were hiring a director, a medical services director, uh -huh. and they were flying people in. So it was, a, it was a very important position. And so we got to see the resumes, and one was, it was horrible. I mean, it was just, it, the, the way it was lined up was, it, it didn't look good. Uh, there were a lot of uh, typos mm -hmm. in there, and you know, immediately, and this person had lots of experience, lots of experience, was a physician, had many degrees, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's the litmus test you have to decide. It makes me crazy because everybody has spell check. You know, it's not like when I was going through and you didn't. Everybody has spell check. So does that say, especially if it's one typo, you're going, hmm. But if it's multiple typos, you're sending me a message as a hiring supervisor that it's not that important. Or I'm so hot, it's not going to be an issue. They're doing it in a job application where they're supposed to be making an impression. What are they going to do on the day-to-day -day job? Yes? A lot of people do. Again, I think it's about preference. If you have time to do that and think it's important to do, great. I personally choose not to go that route. It's a little bit more info than I want, than I need. Um, I think a little bit more info can be a little bit deadly. So I want to be able to form as an objective and opinion about someone and then go and research that. But in some cases, people really do go and use social media to find out. It's, a, it's another form of reference checking. So I would, I would say that's personal preference. The questions on screening, yeah. Um, how, how do you basically handle uh, somebody that has all of the skills, all of the education, all of the um, experience versus somebody that has a, is a better fit with a team and has a lot of potential? I've sat on interview panels in the past, and that always seems to be, you know, one side is basically looking at all of the experience, the skills, and, and uh, education, and the other side is saying, but this is not a really good fit for the team. How do you balance that when you're looking at candidates that could be qualified? If you, if that Great. Would be a Wonderful question. Can you hold that question just for a little bit, and we'll cycle back to making choices and all the dilemmas we face? Excellent question. Not that I'm valuing anybody's questions. Just put that it's on my list. OK. Um, types of interview questions, pretty self-explanatory. And what I want to do, I've got a colleague here, Claire Delgado. And we're going to do a little bit of a very quick mock interview. Come on up. Yeah, come on up. And I want you to take a look at this from the supervisory perspective. So you want to share? Yeah, I'd like to share. I'm sorry. Ms. Delgado, come in. Sit down. It's so oh, lovely so nice to, to meet you. you. So we're going to do a little interview, and I want you to look at this interview from the supervisory perspective, not from her answers per se, OK? So thank you so much for coming in for the job. I wanted to take a, uh, time to just talk with you a little bit more about your resume. So can you just give me a few minutes and give me a background about the summary of your, your experience and how this fits into your career goals? We merged with Ameritech. Oh my! Yes, that must have been an interesting experience. Oh, it was very. It was very. It was a different culture from the Midwest. Really? No, yes. Uh, how was that for you? It was difficult, but I managed. Okay. And then, um, actually, no. First, we merged, merged with SBC. My. And by the time we got to Ameritech, it was a, I was an old pro about it. Were you? When yeah. you say old pro, does that mean you were jaded and acting out when these mergers happen? Well, it was more like resistance is futile. Oh, okay. You will be assimilated. Oh, great. So, so there were some Borg elements going on. Exactly. I see. Exactly. I see. Okay. Well, and then oh, after sorry. that, no, that still goes on. And then oh. after that, we um, merged with AT&T. Uh huh. Sorry, I'm not, I'll make it. Quick. No, no, no. It's all right. AT&T just... outsourced us to IBM. Oh my goodness. But I still support AT&T. Okay. And how was the Borg activity going on there in terms of assimilation? With IBM. Mm hmm A different Borg, but really, yeah. You seem to be in pretty good shape, though. Do you, like, do you like change? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, great. Well, this can be a very stressful work environment. It does sound like you've done lots of stressful change activity. Do you work well in change and with stress? It depends. OK. Um, as you know, this job is going to require moving equipment from place to place. And we're very concerned that people are able to do that. And you seem kind of old. Are you, are you, how old exactly are you? 
Well, I'm 54. Oh, you look pretty good for that age. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how are you at moving equipment? Is that going to be a problem? It may be. Okay, okay. This job sometimes requires overtime, and that's because we want to be very responsive to our clients and to make sure that we're doing after hours access activities and essentially spread ourselves over all the openness that is possible in terms of you know, working parents, early morning appointments, that kind of thing. And I'm very concerned, well, are you married? Do you have kids? What's the story? Because are you gonna be available to work? Um, well, that may be a problem. Really, why? Well, I do have four children. Four children? Yes, two to 18. Good Lord. <laughs> So the little ones, you know, they have their play dates and stuff, and the 18-year-old, well, got to get them here and there. Do they all have the same father? <laughs> well, no. Oh, okay. Well, that's very interesting. I'm sure you've got a really interesting personal life, but we're not going to do that right now. We're talk about what strengths do you bring to this position? Well, I'm really a team player. Okay. What else? Um, I'm a good manager. I'm a good project manager. Can you give me some examples of that? Oh, I managed a software project that... Um, merged that we eliminated the software from one vendor and migrated to a different vendor, saving the company millions of dollars. Wow, you must have been really proud of that. I was very proud of that project. Marvelous, marvelous, that's terrific. And what areas do you believe you'll need help or guidance with in this role? Well, I'll need to learn the processes in place at your company. Okay. Have you had any familiarity with these before? Have you talked with anybody who works here about that? No, not really. Okay, okay, that's good to know. Um, let me see. One of the things, you talked about culture a little bit, and well, our culture is fairly conservative, and you look kind of conservative with how you're dressed and everything. Mm -hmm. um, does that go along with your politics by any chance? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> Great. Um, are, you said already that you don't like conflict, so are you adept at managing conflict with your coworkers? Oh, I had a bit of a problem with a coworker once. Really? Tell me more about that. Well, we sort of stopped speaking to each other for a year. Wow. It's a difficult situation. <laughs> really? Yes. Oh, okay. Fine. Um, and what aspects of your current job do you like most? Um, I like the project management aspects. I like, to be honest, the time off. The too. time off. Okay. Okay. And what do you like least? <coughs> The travel, too the much travel. travel. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming in, Mills Delgado. I really appreciate you being here. I hope I get the job. We'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> so some obvious theatrics there to drive home a few points in excess. What did I do well during the interview? I, inter I interrogated her. So what do you mean by that? Ask follow-up questions? Ask open-ended questions, as opposed to yes and no questions to get information. What else did I do right? Yes? You gave information about the company, not always necessarily appropriate, or what <laughs> I would say, but you, you did volunteer information so that she knows what she's getting into. Great. Volunteer information. So interviews shouldn't necessarily be two-way completely. Well, you should volunteer things to guide the applicant so that they know what they're getting into, much like you were speaking about giving information out up front, that there's overtime work, that you've got to move equipment if that wasn't obvious. What else did I do right? What did I do wrong? <laughs> yes? You were kind of, uh, it was kind of invasive, like, like and it was, it was a lot of kind of like, judgmental tone like <gasps> questions when it really? came to like her personal life. And I mean of course you can take all that in consideration because you want to know like who you're bringing in, but also like to a certain extent like that's not her professional aspect, so that shouldn't too much play in her role if like she's a different baby's father. There is a there is a way to ask information to find out if people are going to be a team fit. And those were not questions that did that. You can sit down and say Tell me about the type of work environment that you most thrive in. Tell me about a culture where you really perform well. What do you know about the organization? What excites you about the possibility of working here? Very open-ended. What else? Well, I was going to say, from what I understand, you could get into some sort of hairy legal and HR situation. Didn't I ask a few illegal questions? Yeah. 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 Age, ability to work, politics, gender, sexual preferences, you name it. All that's illegal. 
is to say this job requires X, can you do X? Um, absolutely, if it's in the job description, and they've rolled themselves in saying, these are job requirements. Tell me about your ability to meet those requirements, as opposed to, you like you could lose a few pounds. And, you know, <laughs> that might be true. It needs to be the voice in your head as opposed to what you're saying, right? <laughs> so use that delete key to elicit that information. What else did I not do well? Yes? Sometimes when Chile asks her questions, you kind of like, it just evaporated. Mm -hmm. You weren't, like you weren't paying attention to what she was saying. Exactly. You just move on to the next thing. Exactly. Wasn't tuned into what she was saying or opportunities. Plus your body language. <clears throat> what about that? You were rolling your eyes. <gasps> I'm shocked. Playing, shocked. Playing to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, you were. <laughs> Absolutely. Think about when you've been on the other side of the interview. Even when you haven't gotten the job, when you felt good about not getting the job, what have been some of the factors? Someone put you at ease? Was genuinely interested in you? Spoke about, <laughs> hold on just a moment. Spoke about the job and the information. Talked to you about maybe you being very well qualified and perhaps having a very strong candidate pool. Thank you for being here. I'm really interested in what you have to say. So putting someone at ease is going to get you information about who they really are. So it goes back to that, how do we get more than what's just on paper? Okay, so that's something that I think is incredibly important. Let me talk a little bit more about the interview process. So put a candidate at ease. Use those open-ended questions, all right? Use silences and pauses to elicit information. I didn't do any of that. So sometimes, and think about when you've been on the receiving end, someone asks you a really tough question. And you go, sputter, sputter, oh my god, I feel myself going down. What do I say? And the silence is there rather than going, oh, clearly you don't have an answer for this question. Let's move on. Just let it hang so that someone can find their, their legwork. And if they're seeing as though that, you know, starting to color and getting a little agitated, say, take your time. It's a very interesting question or it's a tough question. We can come back to that if you want. So whatever it takes, but don't answer the question for them or fill in the gap. So that's that's not that's okay to do that. Absolutely. It's not that wouldn't that's not creating a bias or come back to the question. How many of us have sat down and said, you know, something very specific, give me an example when dot 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 and nothing comes to mind, you draw a blank. So you've got the time, cycle back to that. I can't tell you how many times I've thought of an example where I can say that. Or an inappropriate example comes to mind, even worse, right? <gasps> don't say that, don't say that. So use the silence. Find out how they do with it, and if it's generally about, geez, I can't think of anything now, great, let's cycle back to that. Okay. Avoid judgmental statements. Probe for data, use those follow-up questions. Maintain control. So I can't tell you how many times I've watched supervisors who lose control of the interview because someone suddenly pulls out their list of questions and starts interviewing them. Or will follow up with questions. So you've asked me about culture. I want to know about the culture here. Now, I understand you do these things on Friday, and what's this and what's that? Great, we'll cycle back. I want to go through and ask you some things, but I'm happy to answer your questions at the end of the interview. Okay. And they might be very genuine, and people are really nervous in interviews, so it's not as though this is someone who's really trying to take charge inappropriately. They're just asking that question. And then when you're finished, make sure to record your impressions. So afterwards, it's amazing how things change. So the question that you asked me a little bit earlier was how do you decide, number one, how do you pull out information from people? And number two, when you've got multiple candidates with different skill sets or different perspectives. One of the things that I recommend that you do is to use different interview groups or a panel. And again, this gets back to your perspective as a supervisor, and you have other team members with different perspectives. So as long as you are very clear about how the decision is going to get made, I have the final decision. We're going to use a quantitative scoring system, which I'm rigorously going to go through and train everybody on, and we will use the highest scoring candidate. Or we're going to use a group decision and just weigh in. As long as you're clear about the process, the more viewpoints you get, the better able you are to weigh those perspectives. So you brought up the example, here's someone who's highly skilled, and I'm going to paraphrase, here's someone who was skilled but seemed to really fit with the group. Who do I choose? What a lovely dilemma to have. If you're involving other people, what do you need right now? Bless you. What do you need right now? 
you know, do you have the time and ability to bring someone up to speed? Or is rounding out the team, it's going to be more appropriate to bring someone in who's got to fit with the personality and can be taught whatever is needed. So those are the considerations you have to weigh because it's never clear cut. Never clear cut. The one thing I always talk about is look what you already have as strengths on your team. What do you lack? And do you have candidates that can add to that? Whether it's about personality or preferences or skills or abilities, perspective, life experience, whatever it might be. Is there something that might differentiate these two candidates that will strengthen your team and still be a fit? Yes? You can be very open with them. Number one, I'm always very impressed when people honestly answer, honestly ask, can you give me any feedback? As opposed to, what do you mean I didn't get the job? Which are oftentimes two very different things, right? And you can be very honest and sit down and say, you're well qualified for the job, and we chose another individual who, you could say a lot of different things, was a better fit for the team that we have right now, whose experience was a little broader, whatever it might be. Sit down and say, I really want to encourage you to stay in touch. I really want to encourage you to apply for another opening, if it's true and it's authentic. So you did very well in the interview. If you have recommendations to make, make recommendations as well. You were very technically oriented, but our group didn't get a sense for who you were and how you might manage situations that we encounter very often. So they were a little bit hesitant about that because we weren't clear on your experience and some of the examples you gave didn't give us that, that sense of who you were. So be very honest to the degree that you can, especially if it's an authentic, sincere request for feedback. Other questions on that? Yes? I feel a little bit uncomfortable about not taking the person who seems most qualified for the job when um, looking at somebody who is not a good fit for the team mm -hmm. and weighing that in um, would often mean that they're not like me, mm -hmm. I think, for, to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. not the same, whatever, mm -hmm. gender, age, mm -hmm. range, mm -hmm. um, sexual orientation, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I don't know, I, I would feel uncomfortable about that with um, uh, bringing in discrimination. Okay, two things. One is do your work as a supervisor up front. What do you want in the ideal? Define that as much as you can. And to the degree that you can put qualitative factors into that, that are not about sexual preference, etc. You know, what kind of person do we need on our team right now, given that we would have a choice to put that person on our team? <coughs> What does that look like? Be very specific and be clear that that's what you're looking for with everybody involved in the process. The second piece, and I'm not sure this is what you were saying, but I'll put this out there, and that is, and I think some of you have been in other classes with me, um, I like myself most days. I think I'm pretty smart. I like how I think. But when I'm given the opportunity, I will try to find and hire people that are different than me. Because if I involve people who are different from me around the table with a common value set and a common skill set, we're going to have a better team because that person is going to look at things differently. Now, I'm not going to hire people who are going to make me crazy while they're doing that, obviously. There have to be other things. But I want people different than me because I've already got me on the team. And personally, working with someone like me, you know, working with yourself, if you've ever had to do that, every once in a while, I wake up and go, oh my God, she's just like me. That's why I can't stand her. It's one of those situations where you don't realize it until you're kind of facing that. So that's interesting. You want to work with people that complement you but don't conflict with you. The other thing is, let's face it, most job hiring processes are not about objective, clear hiring criteria. They're qualitative. So as long as you're articulating that, being authentic about that up front, having open conversations, involving other people, you're probably going to be in a safe place with respect to making those hiring decisions. Does that help a little bit? OK. Other comments? Yeah. One thing I want to add, so I recently actually just hired two Berkeley grads, and one of the had so many um, you know, qualified applicants, but mm -hmm. I think like like the main deciding factor was looking at passion, and especially in public health, like if they really were passionate about like, that certain health issue, it looks great to and like so seeing them work, it's just, like you know they really actually so not only does the organization benefit, but also like that staff person too mm -hmm. kind of grow as well. And those are some of the nuances you may not know up front. I mean, you're sitting there looking at skills, experience, organizational exposure, et cetera. Not a lot of people sit down and say, passion, ability to articulate a mission with respect to this. I mean, who really thinks that? Until you encounter that in the interview process and you say, oh my gosh, 
We need someone who's carrying that flag out there because there's some days when I just don't have the strength to carry it. And what a spark of energy. Or we didn't know we were looking for that kind of thing until someone walked in and shared that with us. Wouldn't it be great to see that on our team? So again, do what you can up front, but be open to what you hear. And those are perfect examples of the kinds of things you want to be able to incorporate and say, this is valuable to us. Yeah, I was going to mm -hmm. second that because I, I think it's really interesting how often, you, you know, I've been in many, many interview situations and I am interviewing folks and they have no passion or they don't display <laughs> the passion or, or energy for that matter. Right. It's like, do you really want this job? And they don't, they don't even say that at the end. I mean, which I think is okay to say. You know, I would really, you know, love to have this, be in this role, mm -hmm. and have this position, and join this team. And you know, I mean, because you always get a chance at the end to say right. something, closing words or whatever. And so that's always a good way to do it. So let's give you an opportunity to wrap this up or say anything else you'd like to say. You know, hire me. Isn't that great when people hire me? This is my dream job. I go, yeah, I know. I'm the dream boss. You know? <laughs> you know? You always go to that place. Yes? I think it's important to think at virtual space because I've worked at an interview where I'm like, I was bored and I did not want to work there. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's true. So yeah. think, yeah. Interviews are important for two way information. So that's why I say panel interviews are very important, especially if someone's going to be a member of this team. It gives them a chance to check out the team. And if the team is not a fitter, the team's going, no, I could not work with that woman. And you're saying, why? Well, the way she talks like gets me like really on my like last nerve. You know, fine. You know that there's going to be an issue there if you choose to make that higher. You got that information up front. Okay, so candidate selection. Orientation training. Stop me. Very nice job of stopping me asking questions and weighing in. Need to create so you, you made a hire. This woman's going to be fabulous. I always say woman. Cuz. So create an onboarding plan and make sure that it's unique to what that individual's needs are. Don't forget about the organization, even if they've already worked in the organization. If you're moving departments or teams, different filter, different way of looking at how things work. You're nodding your head, yeah, very different. Make sure that the unit specific orientation is there and any skills that they need. Involve others, so this is where it's a great way to get staff. You don't need to do the training as a supervisor. Give them the overview, give other people modules or specific things to expose them to. Give them the time up front to float around and observe and form their own opinions. Identify resources, so who's their go-to person? Do they have a buddy that they're going to shadow? Are there manuals or books, that deadly thing that you always have to sit down and read? And then you want to make sure you're running this plan past your group as a supervisor because you're inclusive and folks may have viewpoints about what they need to be successful that are different than your perspective. And then monitor that. Are you getting what you need? What are you observing? Check in with this person. Look at feedback. Oftentimes, you'll have a great person, and we fail as supervisors sometimes not to give them the foundation they need to succeed. So I kind of call this moving, um, going slow to move fast. So even if they're sharp, what do they need to jump forward? So any questions on hiring? Yes? Oh, I forgot about that. So I want to hear some stories about good experiences checking references and bad experiences from those of you who have done that. Yes, please. He's got this huge uh, smile on his face, by the way, for those of you who haven't seen it. I had to call um, a reference for a candidate, and the guy was somewhat evasive with my question, which kind of made me laugh. You know, some previous employers are a little bit scared about saying anything negative, yeah. so they kind of skirt certain mm -hmm. things, and um, when I call this guy, he basically just, well, by the end of the day, the job got done. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so first off, I'm always amazed, just like errors on a resume or misrepresentations, how many people give out someone's name as a reference who is not going to give a good reference? They didn't contact. Oh, boy, that used to bug me. I used to get these cold calls, and you never knew who was calling. So if they haven't done the work, that's the first question. Did they give you this person because of the job title or the position or they felt they had to? But what work they, did they not do? Okay. Yes. It's very interesting. It depends on the organization. There are no real legal constraints about that. 
it's all about organizations. So a lot of organizations say, we can't give you anything, but yes, they worked here, the dates of employment, and their jobs. Okay, so that's one thing, and people can say that. Um, another place we'll sit down and say, here are the questions we can't answer for you. Is anything on your list? And that's very true. So they go through the process and say, we want to be open. So if you're asking a reference and the reference says, I'm constrained because I can't give you that information, you can always say, what can you tell me about this person? Okay. If someone is not constrained, just like an interview, ask questions. This came up in the interview. We were wondering how this person manages conflict. Can you give me an example of that? Tell me a little bit more about that. Where would this person rank on your list of you know, top five people? Would this person rank in your list of top five people that you'd want to rehire? We're really looking at the long run in terms of career goals and so forth. And these are some of the possibilities. Do you think this is a good career ladder for this individual in this organization? So open ended interview questions to kind of round out your interview process to get to some of the things that you may not be aware of. So the other piece about references is, and I was saying to people up front here, I had a colleague in grad school that said there are 30 people in the world, the rest is done with mirrors, and I totally believe it, especially at this point in my life. Your informal network is going to give you more information than any formal reference you're ever going to get. So you'd be surprised about just saying, hey, do you happen to know this and such? I'm interested in hiring her. Have I worked with her? Now some people say, oh, that's not very ethical. She only gave us two references. Well, first off, Who's going to give you a bad reference unless someone has really <laughs> screwed up? And secondly, you're trying to find more about this individual, and hopefully those ripples and those circles will reinforce what this individual has already told you. Now, I wouldn't go fishing at some networking meeting with people you don't know. I do that with my immediate network, especially people whose opinions you trust. And more often than not, when I'm in a hiring mode, people will volunteer that information before I even raise my hand and call them. Hi, I hear you're talking to this and such. I cannot tell you how fabulous he is. Hi, I hear you talking to this and such. Don't you dare hire him away. You'll regret it for the rest of your life. His boss is going to come after you with a machete. You know, that kind of thing. He's that wonderful. That kind of thing. So again, use your references to round out anything you want in your interview process. Find out questions, issues, reinforce different kinds of things. Um, particularly with uh, clinical references. Boy, that happens quite a lot. More so than just regular job references, tons of clinical information about their performance, their work relationships, all of that kind of thing comes up. It's very interesting to hear how providers will give that information, whereas other organizations aren't able to do that. So does that help with your question about references? Yes? We, at my organization, started using uh, the method of who. Please. I'm not familiar. Go ahead. And, uh, and one, it, part of that is a, is a phone screening, and it really focuses, the whole process focuses Okay. So we will actually ask candidates, what will your supervisor say about you when I call them? And that is very interesting to see, like, and we ask, how will they rate you on a scale of 1 to 10? You know, like, and it's really interesting to see, I think you get a lot more information, actually, almost out of that. It's like, they're willing to say, like, what the bad things might come out, you know? So I think that's really helpful. Absolutely. It's also interesting because I think most people will say more negative comments about themselves than those folks that will give them good references because they believe in them. Yeah. Yes. To tag on that, I had a question a couple of weeks ago, which was, um, how would your coworkers describe you? Yeah, you know, your past coworkers that you've worked with. So it, it definitely is an opportunity to. Hear. I love that question. How would your coworkers describe you? How would your boss describe you? How would your boss rate you on a scale of one to ten? Okay. Yes. Can you discuss what? To how to approach a situation where you're interviewing candidates and mm -hmm. one or more are from within your unit. So someone wants to get promoted mm -hmm. and you're also considering an external candidate. Mm -hmm. First off, you do the exact same approach as you did before and you're separating them out from the conversation about how to interview and what you're doing. But clearly since they're in the work unit, you have to handle the follow-up differently. So if they get the job, great. But then you have to take a look at your onboarding plan and plant in their mind that they have a new position, a new role, not to take a lot for granted and that really they have to approach it as though they're in a new job and they're starting all over so they can be successful. So that's one thing. If they don't get the job, I think you owe it to that individual to sit down and be as forthcoming about why and how you as a coach are going to help them move forward so that the next time an opening comes around that's appropriate, they can do that. They can be more successful. In, you know, one Go ahead. thing that's come up is where students will intern with an organization mm -hmm. 
and then they actually get a, a job with the organization. Right. And, and so they go from being an intern to a full-time employee. Uh -huh. And sometimes that, that's a little quirky there. It creates mm -hmm. a little conflict, so mm -hmm. something to be. Every time you're in an organization and you move jobs, again, as a supervisor, help that person differentiate him or herself in that new role so that people are seeing them with different eyes. You have different expectations performance-wise. You have different expectations about what they're going to do. And you want to make sure those around them see that as, oh, this could be someone from the outside doing this job. Let's make sure that this person's going to be successful. Same thing, intern to resident to entry-level job, whatever you're going to do. Sometimes you have to brand yourself differently in that way. So, and that's always a challenge because you're there, you're familiar. People know what you eat for lunch, et cetera. So you want to make sure that you are crafting that difference for people. Okay. I saw a hand in the back. Yes. We started doing that at our practice. We started getting um, students from the um, medical assistant mm -hmm. club, and that's helped out a great deal. Um, a lot of stuff comes up to the surface uh -huh. that you would not get necessarily from a resume from a reference, and you really get a more yeah. visual identity with how they work with the team. If they're, you know, they're going to be a good fit. Um, I've actually hired someone from that. Yeah, it's always nice working with known entities that'll share a little bit more info yeah. with you, especially if there's a question at all. Right. Yeah. So I'm looking at my watch. I want to make sure to get through what's important for you. Um, someone did ask a question about creating a team, but I know you had a whole session on that, right? So anything you want to share about creating a team? So you've hired this person and you put them in a team. Can you just kind of throw out what you learned last time about helping to foster a team? Clear roles. Clear roles, very important. Ground rules. Ground rules. What else? Expectations are very clear. Performance measures for everybody. Very clear on where people need help or what they're doing. What you're going to do when things go off track. Timelines, accountabilities, time with people. Praise, celebration, when things crash and burn. As a leader, trying to get people back on track by sitting down, debriefing about the situation constructively, bringing people back together, involving them in the solutions. Sounding familiar, I'm assuming. So as you create this team, remember, even if this person has been on that team before, if they're in a new role, don't <laughs> presume that the team is going to be stagnant or static. Put it together in a new way. Uh, coaching. I'm going to blitz through this. Didn't hear a whole lot of stuff. Um, these are all the things that you need to do as a coach. And when I say coach, as a supervisor, that's probably 95% of what you do. If you're given a group of people, sometimes just one person. And it's just like a sports team. You have to identify what they're good at, where they can play, where they can play, the multiple positions that they might be able to play, and what happens if somebody gets sick or falls down, or if the game pace starts going a lot faster. So lots of different things here. You need to communicate clearly and effectively to team members. So you have to find out how they like to hear information. I once worked with a team that were email people. And that drove me crazy, because I'm an extrovert and I like talking with groups. They didn't like staff meetings very often. I wanted to get together once a week. They said, all right, can we do it twice a month and the other two months, can you just shoot us an email about what you want? We had to find some compromises. How do people like to hear information? Is it meetings? Is it memos? Is it quick huddles? So making sure you're clear on how they hear best and how you can disseminate information most quickly when there's a need for that. Genuine interest. So again. I've worked with lots of people that I don't necessarily get along with perfectly, but we're fabulous team members. And whenever you're having conflict with people, especially your team members, remember that you have something in common with everybody on that team. And your job is to figure out what that is so you can value it. That's about managing diversity. So when I personally am having conflict with individuals, the way that I like to look at it first mm -hmm. is to say, I'm having trouble managing someone who's different than I am. Let me figure out where we have some commonalities. Let me figure out if I'm getting stuck not being able to appreciate this person's perspective and go from there. So I've got to figure out how to be genuinely interested in this person and their problem, even if I've heard it 40,000 times before. You know, we've all heard that. We've got friends like that where you're going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Got to be genuine about that. Following up, very important. 
expertise. So again, and a lot of times you could be a new supervisor and it is so important, I think, especially to younger individuals to feel as though they know what their team needs to be doing and to be expert and adept in everything that's out there. You don't need that. That's not your job. It's the individual's jobs to be expert in those roles. It's your job to know how to pull out the best in them, to get out of their way, and to make things happen. You need to understand what they do. You need to understand how to ask the right questions when something goes wrong with something in particular that's about expertise or functionality. But you don't need to know how, they're, how to do their job. And that sometimes is very hard for new supervisors, particularly when we're promoted from a technical position to a supervisory position. So confidence is about, I have confidence in your ability to do this job. And I have confidence that when I come to you, you're going to tell me what I need to know. Inspirational. So this isn't necessarily with pom-poms. But this is about being optimistic. When things happen, helping people vent, problem solve, and find out solutions. Getting to be mission-oriented with whatever work you have, I can see us getting there, celebrating those milestones. Love people accept responsibility for themselves and for their team's progress and or mistakes. Okay. So if the team has made a mistake, it is your mistake as a supervisor. Even if they didn't do something you told them to do. Because the fact that they didn't do it, something's amiss with your interaction. So you need to have choices and undesired outcomes. You need to own those. Have your opinions. Be that authentic leader. But try to be viewed as objective. Have that information, expertise, and knowledge. Pass that along. Be flexible. So I could do a whole little module around change management. But as supervisors, your middle name should be Gumby. I might be dating myself. Because you remember Gumby, the little? OK, thank you. So Gumby, you've got to do that, because that's part of what you've got to do. As things are being thrown at you, taking it in, understanding what's important, and whipping around and telling your team, this is the way we're going to go, going back to creating that roadmap. Focus and calm under pressure. This isn't me. I think I'm a pretty good supervisor. This isn't normally me. I'm very focused. Calm under pressure, I kind of act out when things happen that are really frustrating. I think it's the ability just to bounce back and be able to focus people and move them forward. So venting in things under pressure is always normal. Laughing about things that are happening that shouldn't be happening is important. And humor, 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 humor. Especially with yourself, being able to laugh at yourself and what's going on. So these are just some coaching items. Can you say yeah. something about gossip? <laughs> Love it. What else? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So gossip. So remember that teams are social circles, right? There are going to be people who talk about people who talk about people who talk about people. That's just kind of inherent. It happens in our families. It happens in our relationships with other people. It happens in the workplace. What you do want to do is address any gossip that is not constructive. And that gets down with setting norms for the team. So if you were trashing her and you're not getting along, that's not OK. That is absolutely not OK with me. And setting that norm in a boundary is something that's there. On the other hand, if you're talking to him about the person that she was with last weekend, and then there's somebody else the weekend before, maybe it's between the two of you. I don't want to know about it. And I don't want her to know that you're talking about it, because it might break something down. But I might be talking to you about, you know, if that got out, do you really want her to know that you're talking about her behind her back? You're like, oh, she knows. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> So again, reinforcing how do you want the group to, re to behave and setting those norms and expectations and modeling them, modeling them, modeling them. How often do you go, oh, I so know she is like that, and she is getting on my last nerve, right? That's a human response. But when you're not putting into action expectations that you have for other people, they pick up on it. And they're seeing you as being, um, um, how do you say it, um, wishy-washy and um, hypocritical is what I was looking at. Do as I say is not as I do. Yes? Um, I had a supervisor who was the program director for social services um, agency, and we were having some relationship problems with our team. <coughs> and he would always tell us, um, because you know everyone would come to work and go, hi, good morning, you know, and like go through the motions of going through the day. And he would say, I know you all know how to be nice to each other. I'm asking you to be kind to each <gasps> I other. I like that. And it was, and it was just always such, a good distinction, I think, to like put us in the mindset of this requires, we're all here for a common goal. It requires something different than just being nice on the surface. I like that. Be kind to each other instead of just being nice to each other. That's harder to do, but it's a whole lot 
loftier. Yeah, I like that. And again, it doesn't mean you have to like everybody, right? Okay, so I'm going to blitz through if it's okay. I want to make sure we get to performance evaluations. And, and also yes. difficult people. And difficult people. I'll try to touch a little bit on that. Okay, so coaching tools. Put up there. These are all the kinds of things that you need to do. Talked about that a little bit. Let's go to performance evals. And then I'll talk about difficult people. I'll try to talk about difficult people. So you can do performance plans in lots of different ways. And if you work in organizations that have a lot of structure to them, you're normally given a template. This is what you will fill in. There are a couple things that I want to say. Number one, um, that performance evaluations are not done yearly or quarterly. You as a coach should be giving people feedback, constructive feedback on an ongoing basis. By the time you get to a performance evaluation, there should be no surprises. Now, there might be someone who says, well, I thought I rated higher than that. Or, geez, um, I, I'm not really clear that that was a big deal to you. They should have heard everything that you put in that evaluation, good and bad, before, multiple times. Okay. Most supervisors don't do that. They do not. They do not. And think of how unfair that is to the individual involved and how much you are losing out on tapping into that person's ability. This is one of the most time-consuming things to do. I hated doing performance evaluations. I hated doing them. But for the most part, I finally got down into a rhythm where all I have to do, it's almost like a spreadsheet. I made that entry three months ago. I did this. I did this. I talked to her about this. I did this. I made sure. That, so it was just pulling the info together, which I happen not to like. But it wasn't about, oh my goodness, I have to have a first conversation with her about, yeah, you know, I'm about to fire you. Um, just thought you should know. So everything you put in a performance evaluation should have been heard, heard by that employee at least once before. So you should have goals and objectives. You should have a standard underneath that. You should have an example for how that's going to be measured. And then you should have a measurement of actual performance. And this is one list of things that you can have. You can do it quantifiably. That's one way. Feedback from you and others. Do 360s. You can do informal polls. You can do whatever works in terms of providing feedback. Ongoing documentation that you have shared with the employee. Work samples. Comparison to timelines. You beat that timeline, and the quality of the product was great. OK, so again, shouldn't be a guessing game. Shouldn't be hammers. Uh, everything in a performance plan, even if it's quantifiable, you should be able to be specific and clear about your expectations, measurable, action-oriented, results focus, and time frame. Okay. As much as possible, people should be very clear on what you expect. So I know where I am, but I'm not spending my time guessing about what you want. I'm spending my time doing what you need me to do. Okay. So when you're doing this performance, you should make sure that you've got plenty of time to put something together. I really encourage feedback from others. So I always used to ask for self-evaluations. And I was pointing to someone over here. She was nodding. The reality is most people's self-evaluations are going to be much harsher than anything I would put together where there are issues, or much less praise-oriented than I would be. Think about it. When you're sitting down, some of you might be just dead on. I'm one of those women who, how do you feel about how you do on this? Oh my god, it was so bad. And it's a little bit of drama in there, but for the most part, I see myself differently, and I'm harder on myself than other people see me. And so it's really nice when I walk in, and I'm thinking, OK, well, the rating scale is 1 to 5. And I probably would have given myself a 3 and a half. And someone says, Julie, you scored a 4 and a half here. I just have to tell you how great we think you did. And I'm going, really? Tell me more. And I walk out with all those great warm fuzzies. It's nice. If I respect that person, it's great. If I don't respect that person, I'm going, you would rate me a 4 and a half, not realizing I'm actually a 2. You know? <laughs> so there's got to be that dynamic there. If you're respecting that feedback, that's always great. Want to have collaborative discussion and evaluation. It's also time to do some career planning. Where do you want to go? How do you feel about that project? How do you want to use what you've done? I've just seen some remarkable progress. I'd like you to build on that. Here's how. Set up a follow-up meeting to set down into specific career objectives or goal setting for the next period. And sit down and create a new performance plan for the next cycle. So I like collaboration. I like engagement. I like ownership. I like feedback from other people and whatever really works for you. Informal surveys. Self-feedback, 360s, anonymous input, whatever your organization has going on. 
What else can I tell you about performance evaluations? Questions? People doing differently or have, have other thoughts about this? Yes? I always say do those asks. So if you're on the receiving end of an evaluation and talking about managing up and you haven't had an opportunity for whatever reason and you try to create those opportunities, that's a great place to say thank you for that feedback. I'm sorry I fell short on that. We've talked about that. Can I let you know I would like to see some of this from you to help me in those situations. What do you think about that? Or I'd like to hear a little bit more about why you don't see what I'm doing as being effective for me. And that when I'm doing that, that you let me know in the moment or shortly thereafter. Because I really don't see it. I don't know why I'm missing it. So I always call it doing ask. Again, collaborating there. Letting your employee know that you are there for them in terms of coaching their performance and making them successful. And likewise, you upwards, same sort of thing. Ask for what you need so that you can be successful. And find out if your supervisor will be able to give that to you. Absolutely. And hopefully that's happening along the way. Performance evaluations, if you haven't been able to do that, is great. It's a great place to ask for promotions, too. I want to ready myself for being queen goddess. What do I need to do to get there? So you don't often walk down the hallway to the water cooler, right? Hey, I want to be queen goddess. What do I need to do to get there? So performance evaluation, where you've got it all there, is clear. Well, Julie, first off, we need to find a tiara that's your size. And you kind of got a big head, so that's going to be different. You know, whatever it might be, being very clear with that person about what they need to move forward in whatever direction they're looking at. It's also a great time to say, I'm not sure that's the best place for you. I would help you do that. I would like you to consider this over here. Okay. You know what, yeah, go ahead. You know what I've seen a lot mm -hmm. is the actual performance evaluation is given to the, this happened to me. It's given to me. It's like, fill it out, Bernard, and then we'll, then we'll, do, we'll work on mm -hmm. it afterwards. And we'll, uh, then I'll do my comments. It's like, who, who, who goes last, you know? <laughs> Playing that game a little bit, you know? And again, that's a, I like to reframe that and say that's a self-evaluation. That's an opportunity for me to tell you things that you may or may not support or see in me. So that's an opportunity to give you things to work with. But I, I always you don't thought see it that as, way. you know, you are shirking your responsibility oh. as my supervisor to, you know, no, your job is to give me feedback. You're not doing it. You're asking me to give oh, myself feedback. Yeah. And then you're commenting on what I have. In the absence of feedback, that really is not our prime effective supervisor. Absolutely not. But when there is feedback, I was curious to see that you really thought you didn't do well in this situation because I see you very differently, Bernard. Yeah. And so when I match mine up, it's an opportunity. The fact that someone is asking me for input on my own performance evaluation, to me, is very powerful. Sure. Very powerful. Now, I personally have to be ready to hear some things that might be different, but I'm hoping that we'll have a meeting of the mind because of our interactions over the course of that review period. Now, if it's somebody saying, check, 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 signing it, that's, what, that's the dark side page over here, where you're not getting that feedback in a way that is valuing to you or helpful in terms of development. Saw some hands back there? Yeah. yeah. Well, I can, but that kind of, I came from, um, we, we did do our self-assessment before our manager's dinner review, and part of that was so that you could guide what's important for you, which is not, you, you're part of this, so you're 50% at least of what's mm -hmm. going on here. Yeah. You can't just have a manager tell you what they're saying if you're not communicating. No, I, I understand that, but I, I was just in a situation where they just didn't want to do it. Yeah. And that's us, yeah. yeah. That to me is, is such a lost opportunity and yeah. pretty much unforgivable to me as a supervisor. They're in the wrong job. This is, a, this is a huge, huge, huge responsibility. It's a piece of what we all need to do. So is, is during the evaluation performance an appropriate time, and if not, when? Can you, as a supervisor, address what may seem to be like personal problems and burnout mm -hmm. going on? Like, there's something to be said for like knowing your coworkers on a more personal level, but then I think in social services it gets kind of messy sometimes because mm -hmm. high burnout. A lot of people don't have good self care, and how if like when your first life was like the cost of hiring the wrong right. fit. Sometimes you get someone who just 
doesn't have the self-care, doesn't know how to manage their own right. emotional triggers in the work, and then they tax the team because they're always going to team members right. with their personal stuff. How, how do you bridge that topic or manage that in terms of like not just referring them to employee the assistance, but like the day-to-day -day impact on the work environment? Do it in the moment when you're seeing behaviors that are not constructive or helpful. That's my recommendation. So if you see behaviors that are getting in the way of an employee success, or you see behaviors that are triggers or flags and causing you gut concerns about someone, do it in the moment, not waiting for this. Pull them aside, even if you're coworkers, pull them aside. What's going on? I'm noticing these behaviors, as opposed to, you seem to have a bad attitude. I'm noticing these behaviors, and those are different than where you are. What's going on? If this person isn't gonna be, be open with you as a supervisor for whatever reason, you gotta respect those boundaries. Then you can refer to EAP, but you want to also send a signal, I want you to be okay. I want you to know if you're comfortable, come to me, and let's talk about how we can work with whatever's going on with you. Because I want you to be okay. I'm really concerned about you right now. So you wait till here, it might be too late. If you've seen a continued pattern, you've been doing this all along, it's a great time to say, I'm getting the sense that you're in a bad place right now, and I'm really concerned about what this might be doing to you professionally. Let's talk about where you are, and let's talk about whether this is the right place for you today. So use it as a catalyst, provided you've had some of that groundwork laid and you've had some of those conversations already. Does that help? OK. That's always a tough one, very, very tough. You want to honor personal boundaries, but at the same time, those terrible, terrible situations can occur. And I always say, I'm going to step on someone's boundary, possibly, because I'm going to imagine it going to the worst possible place. And was there something that I could have done in advance to prevent that? And usually it turns out better than I would have thought it to, to happen. Because those of us who have been around for a while have seen those bad situations. You always say, what could I have done differently? How could I have helped avoid this? So do what you can do. That's your job to make sure people are cared for, and especially in social services. Did you have your hand up? Or, OK. See how responsible I am? You were just stretching. <laughs> So um, again, you haven't done your job if someone is surprised. They can disagree with the rating. They can disagree with it being used as a key example. But if they've heard it, and they've heard it often, and you've stressed it, great. This should not be a time for coming in and giving them surprises. Lost opportunity, that's your supervisory issue. Okay. Any questions on performance evaluations, given what you wanted to talk about? Where he's going, oh, it's almost six. Conflict, let's talk about conflict. And I don't really have a lot of slides on conflict, so I'm going to blank out for a second. What kind of conflict situations do you want me to comment on? Thank you. Um, personalities. Um, and if you're talking about the Gen X, Gen Y, um, that's one of the things that I have found is really hard to manage with mm -hmm. employees. Um, the older employees, those that have been with an employer for a longer period of time, sometimes feel entitlement, um, which you have to kind of, you have to manage that very delicately. You, you, you know, so whenever you're managing people, you have to kind of accentuate the positives about them, um, you know, make them feel that they're still worth uh, a great deal to the organization, um, and kind of stress the importance that they have with regards to training mm -hmm. the newbies that come in, and how you know effective they can be in guiding their careers. Um, mm -hmm. But when you have someone that has entitlement, if they some of the responsibility seems to get shipped downward, and the younger ones get resentful about that. So I'm going to say that your job as a supervisor is to manage those generational differences, to understand and to manage them. The, the, the generational, the personalities. Whatever it is, backgrounds, gender, sexual preference, ethnicity, race, um, generation, all of that are your jobs to manage. So you've got to understand them first. And there's a lot of good generational literature out there. And I love your example. Baby boomers, here's this really difficult job that's asking you to work extra hours. 
Baby boomers are going to say, I'm glad for the job. Gen Xers are going to sit there and say, I wish the baby boomers would get out of the way so I could get their jobs. And the Gen Ys are going to be sitting down and going, eh, I'm leaving at five because I got better and more interesting things to do. And you've all got them on a work team. And when you're trying to put in extra hours, and I'm being stereotypical about those differences, but fairly constant. So you've got them all on a work team. Imagine the kind of conflicts that are going to come up. And depending on where you are personally, even more so. So you've got to understand those differences. And then you have to be able to speak the dialect that is important to them. So no matter what your personal background is, you have to be able to articulate what your group is doing, where you want to go, what their role is, and what you need them to do. And what you need them to do is based on the value you see in them. So everybody has some value construct that you can speak to in their dialect. But it is hard to juggle. It is very hard to juggle. So 25 years ago, I was hearing people talk about how awful it was to have women in management because they were so much more emotional than men. And I'd sit there and go, damn straight we are. <laughs> Take them out, you know, so that kind of thing. That was the issue way back when, right? Oh my goodness, women. And then women of color, how did they get here? They just don't understand the corporate values that we have. You know, you're sitting there going, thank you for sharing, Dr. X, right? And you have to find a way to speak with that individual so you're getting around whatever baggage they're bringing in that's a stereotype. What is going to motivate that individual so they're on your roadmap, they're working as part of a team, even with those differences, they see you as valuing them, and they're responsive to what you want them to do. So to me, any problems that you have around those dynamics, it's about you personally learning to work with diversity, no matter what that might be. And some days we're better at it than others. You know, I'm one of those people that keeps going, I walked uphill both ways in the snow to school, and you should be happy to be here. And then I'll envy the 22, 23 year olds that are sitting down and saying, this is just a job. And I really like what we do, and I like why we do it, but I've got this other whole life out here. I'm really envious of that perspective to be able to walk away and keep boundaries and boxes. The bells are ringing. Uh, bells are ringing. <laughs> So let me do two things. I'm happy to stay around and talk about anything else you want. Real fast, you want to go through the quiz, or do you think it's self-evident? Self-evident? Good. I try to do it that way. Any final questions? I do have a lot of slides. If you want to get those slides, you can leave me your email here, or you can take a card and ask me for those. Thank you very much. Good group. I hope I got on your high-value items. Thank you. Good, Wonderful. good, Great excellent. Job. Great Thank job. you. We got to bring you back. This is. Uh, Can't remember what no, I did. Not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Nice to see. you.